Usually any Final Fantasy game would take at least a thousand turns to complete, even if it was being played somewhat efficiently. But if we try, how low can we drive that number, at least for Final Fantasy VI? Let's take a look. First off, what exactly are we defining a turn to be? For the purposes of this challenge, a turn is simply any command that we select in combat. That can be fight, item, a special skill, or even row or defend. This excludes anything that's done outside of combat, including magic and item use. Second, let's define the rules. I'm going to say that all glitches are off limits. No phasing through soldiers, no sleep warping, and no drawing ourselves to another dimension. Otherwise this just becomes the any percent speed run with extra steps. In addition, FF6 has a feature where EXP is retained after the player dies. We're allowed to abuse this if we want, but any turns we take in before we die will count towards the total, so we can't just level to 99 and kill ourselves to grind for free. Now, should this run be tool assisted or not? In other words, are we looking for an absolutely optimal strategy, or the best strategy that we can realistically do in real time? Well, it turns out there's not a super huge difference, so I'll just show both and you can consider whatever you want to be canon. With that said, let's get started. As soon as the game loads, we're immediately thrown into a series of battles in Narsh. Even in the first fight of the game, we shouldn't fall asleep at the wheel and firebeam both of the guards. That would cost two whole turns, and is totally unnecessary. First off, these guys are escapable, so we can just run away to avoid spending any turns at all. However, before we do that, we need these guys to do some work for us. In the near future, we're going to be forced to fight some battles, so we'll get some EXP in the process. Giving this EXP to Big some Wedge would be a huge waste since they won't be sticking around very long. Under these restrictions, the only way to avoid wasting this EXP is to let them die, and this is the best time to do it. If we put Biggs and Wedge in the front row and Terra in the back, they'll take almost twice as much damage and probably kick the bucket before Terra is in danger of dying herself. After we run away, we can heal Terra outside of combat with cure spells. The second set of fights can be avoided by walking around the tile that triggers the battle, saving a turn. The third battle is where we're finally forced to spend a precious turn. Not only is this a pincer attack, but the Lobo is also an inescapable enemy. Both problems can be solved by hitting the right side of the screen with a bioblast, allowing us to run away. However, it turns out that's not the best option. You see, the EXP from this fight happens to be enough to give Terra an extra level. As it turns out, that level will end up saving two turns later on, and it only costs one turn to finish off the remaining guard. So in a hearty blow to all guard 5 fans everywhere, he gets toasted bringing Terra to level 4 and our turn count to 2. The final encounter in this section contains some inescapable mammoths. As this isn't a pincer attack, one bioblast finishes them all, bringing Terra to level 5. Racing Terra's level in this section is more important than it may seem. You see, the level that characters join at depends on the average level of the characters that are already in the party. Since Terra is the only party member right now, raising her level by 2 also raises the level average by 2. Therefore, any level for Terra right now translates into a level for every other character to join the party. Pretty sweet deal. Speaking of levels, being at 5 instead of 4 reduces the number of tech missiles that we need to kill Walk from 4 to 3. This means that the extra turn we spent killing the guard has already paid for itself. The Wilk fight is otherwise unremarkable. Obviously we'll run from every random encounter that we can for now. This effectively caps the amount of EXP and cash that we can get at this moment, but we'll make do. Before we escape Narsh, we still need to go through the multi-party Moogle battle. While we can avoid all the enemies with careful movement, we actually do want to fight one battle in order to learn Dusk Requiem with Mog. Mog can kill the Mammoth in one hit, and any of the other Moogles can finish off the dog. Mog doesn't need his spear or shield anymore, so Locke steals that gear like the, um, treasure hunter that he is. To finish off Marshall, we just need to tell Mog to dance. Since Mog acts on his own while dancing, we only need to spend one turn to win the entire fight. You'd think a strat like that would be useful going forward, but it never comes up again, so yeah. Next, we head down to Figaro. The item shop guy's family can starve, but we buy a noise blaster and bio blaster from the tool shop. I expected the latter to be as useless as it turned out to be, but I bought it anyways out of an abundance of caution. After a bunch of cutscenes, we recruit Edgar and fight some Magitek armors. It takes two turns at best to take these guys out with the auto crossbow. However, we can do a bit better than that. These guys happen to be vulnerable to confused status, and when inflicted with confused, there's a chance they'll use tech laser on themselves repeatedly. If they use it six times in a row, they'll commit Sudoku without wasting more than a single turn. I think the odds of a tech laser on any given turn are 75%, so our odds of getting through the battle aren't too bad. In this run, I won the battle on my fourth try, which is pretty decent. 
Our next goal is to reach the Returner's Hideout. On the way there, we pass through our first town, South Figaro. Our budget is pretty tight, so we need to spend carefully. We first head into the basement of the rich man's house early to snag ourselves some extra spending money and some useful relics. We also grab all the other hidden items around town. I know this turns into better stuff in the world of Ruin, but cash is tight enough that this collection of vendor trash is more useful now than a couple of explosions and elixirs would be later. With that, we have around 3000 GP to play with. From the relic shop, we buy the true knights and protecting party, Memebers, will be mildly useful against Vargas. For once, the Regal Cutlass is worth its hefty 800 GP price tag, and we also buy the best armor we can equip. With our spare cash, we buy a couple antidotes in case we get poisoned on Mount Colts. Against Vargas, it's time to bust out a strategy that the FF6 vets out there were probably just waiting for me to use. In this game, each character has a unique, obnoxiously powerful attack that occasionally replaces a normal fight command. This is called a Desperation Attack, or DA for short. For this to happen, a bunch of conditions have to be met. 1. The character must be in near fatal status. In other words, they gotta be crouching because they have less than 1 eighth of their HP remaining. 2. At least 25.6 seconds must have passed in the current fight. This makes the first condition a lot harder to achieve, since we can't just walk into the fight at low HP and immediately have everyone attack. We need to time it so our characters end up at low HP at the right time. 3. The character can't have any of these status effects, which isn't really a big deal. 4. The character can't have already used a DA in the current fight, so we can't DA multiple times with our strongest character. And 5. With all the above conditions met, there's still only a 1 in 16 chance that the attack is a DA. This is the part that makes it really painful to abuse these. With all that in mind, the optimal strat against Vargas becomes clear. Just DA three times to finish off the bears, and provoke the cutscene where Savin enters the fight. Then we can use the obligatory pummel to finish the fight in just four turns. However, this is rather brutal to pull off in real time. Remember that HDA is a 1 in 16 chance. The odds of pulling off three in a row is 1 in 16 cubed, and that's not even counting the fact that all three characters have to get knocked to low HP at the right moment to even use a DA. It's hard to calculate exactly, but I'd guess the odds of that happening are about 1 in 3 with the right strats. Overall, this gives us a whopping 1 in 12,000 chance of victory here. At 5 minutes per reset, this is expected to take around 1,000 hours, give or take a couple hundred. Now, this isn't as long as the heat death of the universe or anything. It's certainly humanly doable at any rate. People have done crazier things before. But do I really want to do it? Not really. So I'll just take the L here and move on. If you want to be the one to do it, be my guest. But I did tacit to prove to myself that this really does work. So without tool assistance, what can we do instead? Well, using the auto crossbow with the Hyperis and the Atlas armlet equipped, we can reliably take out the bears in three turns. Then we finish Vargas with a DA, since getting just one isn't all that crazy. It's still expected to take a little over an hour, but what do you know, I happen to get it on my very first attempt. Get used to that good luck, cause you'll be seeing a lot more where that came from. With that, we're up to 14 turns with tool assists at 15 turns without. After the Vargas fight, we use up the warp stone obtained in South Figaro to prevent any chance of running into a pincer attack on the way out. This means that we need to run through Mount Colts again, but it's a small price to pay for the safety. At the Returner's Hideout, we say no to Bandit's request three times to acquire the Genji Glove instead of the Gauntlet. Before the scenario split, we have one more obstacle in the first Ultros fight. Again, the best strategy is obvious, just DA him twice using Edgar and Sabin. However, getting even two DAs in a row is no small feat, and even with two DAs, our odds of dealing enough damage to kill are only about 1 in 4. At about 2 minutes per reset, this is expected to take about 33 hours. Truth be told, if I didn't task Vargas already, I would've just bit the bullet and done this, but it loses its appeal a bit when it doesn't actually result in a perfect run. As an aside, this is the second place where the extra level on Terra saves a turn. It's impossible to kill Ultros in two hits if Agar and Sabin are level 7. It only saves a turn for the task strat, but at least it's something. The non-task strat is similar in this case. Just attack three times and hope for two DAs in those three attacks. The 3 hit kill is still a damage range, but it'll almost always work out. The only question is how we'll get down to low HP when the DA timer expires. Well as it turns out, Ultra's weakness is that he talks too much. If we turn the message speed down to 6 so the text takes as long as possible to disappear, he'll run out the DA timer after just 2 of his turns. 
This means we can enter the fight with Edgar and Sabin at low HP. The first attack will always be a normal attack, which Terra can defend the guys from with a true knight. On a second turn, Ultras will always flatten Terra with Tentacle. At this point, the DA timer has run out, and we can get off all three attacks before Ulti's next turn for a smooth win. The expected time for beating Ultros was a little under 3 hours, but my luck was above average and I got it a little over 2. This puts us at 16 turns when tassing, and 18 turns when playing legit. Okay, so, full disclosure, all the footage from here on out is from a different run. I had to redo the earlier parts of the game because of a mistake, so you'll see some discrepancies like Locke being level 6 now. I think it'll soon become clear why none of these discrepancies matter much, but I felt I should point this out anyways. With that said, it's time for the scenarios! It's blindingly obvious that we should do Bannon's scenario first, since that group doesn't need to fight anything and it gives us a chance to nab Edgar and Terra's equipment. We can also pick up the Rune Edge, which will be important later. The next choice is less obvious. It turns out that doing Savin's scenario first saves exactly one turn. I'll explain why in a bit. Picking up Shadow, we immediately head down to the Imperial camp and switch focus to Cyan. He can finish off the leader in a single retort, netting us the single most important item in this run, the Black Belt. This relic allows characters to counterattack when struck. In other words, we now have a way of attacking without spending any turns. Some sources, including the usually reliable algorithms fact, report the odds of a counterattack at 25%, but I'm convinced it's actually 75%. At this point, the game changes dramatically. First off, between Interceptor, the Berserk inflicting Crass Hoppers, and the Black Belt, we now have several different ways to grind without spending turns. Second, the focus of boss fights now shifts from what is our strongest possible attack to how can we realistically kill this thing with only counterattacks. By playing it smart and understanding exactly what we need to win, we can save ourselves hours of grinding. Speaking of grinding, we waste no time in grinding Sabin to level 15 and Shadow to 10 in preparation for the train. We want to grind on the overworld since the enemies in dungeons give low EXP to make up for the length of Sabin's scenario. I should have gained two more levels with Sabin and one more level with Shadow, but as you'll see it didn't end up mattering. This took about an hour and 20 minutes, but it could have been maybe 20 minutes faster if I actually remembered to set the battle speed to 1 so the enemies would attack faster. Unfortunately, we gained the Black Belt just in time for the one location where it barely helps us at all. Inside the Imperial camp, we first need to fight two battles with Kefka. He just needs to be hit once each time, but he's technically a party member for this fight so the Black Belt doesn't allow us to hit him. While Interceptor will occasionally block attacks, he'll never counterattack Kefka either. This costs us two turns. We skip Telstar since the Green Bray isn't nearly worth the grinding we need to fight him. We're incredibly overleveled for the Templar and Soldier fight, so it's a breeze. Next, we fight a few battles where Cyan will chop up all the soldiers of his own accord. Then we get to the Magic Deck Armor section. Unfortunately, Counter Attacks and Interceptor don't work when we're in Magic Tech Armor, so our only options are Magic Tech and Item. And since the Bioblast skill is unique to Terra, we have to individually target every single enemy. Well, there is a Thunder Rod and Lock scenario that we could break to instantly wipe one encounter, but this saves us two turns at best when the Black Belt saves us three in Lock scenario. So as inelegant as it is, we just have to accept spending a whopping six turns to escape this camp. Anyways, now we have to face the biggest challenge in the entire game. We have to resist the urge to suplex the train. No? No? Oh come on! In all seriousness, I was expecting some combination of counterattacks, Berserk from Evil 2, and Interceptor to get us through this fight with ease, but I forgot just how often and consistently he uses multi-target spells. I was just starting to think I'd need to do a bit more grinding when Sabin managed to pull off a freaking DA as a counterattack and one-shot the train. Not only was I not trying to do that, but this was literally my second attempt at the fight. The last obstacle before finishing off Sabin's scenario is Baron Falls. We spend another 15 minutes to grind Sabin to 17 so we can reliably kill Rhizopaz in 4 hits. We can't make use of the Genji Glove here, since Sabin and Cyan only have one weapon apiece, which is pretty sad because it would make a huge difference. Cyan is also healed right before the fight, which is unfortunate because we actually want him dead. Rhizopaz has a chance of using El Nino every other turn, and seeing it even once is basically an instant game over. This means that we only want Sabin on the field, so the fight ends as fast as possible, one way or the other. The best we can do is stick Cyan in the front without any armor, and hope the piranhas eat him before Rhizopaz shows up. The fight ended up taking two attempts. 
On the winning run, Seven got a lucky crit, which was key to our success. And after spending one more turn to use a drag beat on Gao, Seven's scenario is over. At this point, Locke's scenario is the only one left unfinished. For clarity, let's go through how this scenario is supposed to work. We'd normally steal this merchant's outfit to bypass this kid, and exit his house through the back door. Then we steal the soldier's outfit to tell a guard that his shift is up, and finally, we steal the last merchant's clothes and his cider, which will allow us to open the secret passageway and escape. But what if I told you that we can beat Locke's scenario with no stealing whatsoever? Well, the only reason why we would need to get past this kid is because there's a heavy armor guarding the usual path through the town. But there's nothing stopping us from just killing the heavy armor and walking through. This guy is pretty dangerous even to a normal player, so we won't win a fair fight with just the black belt. Instead, we'll need to pull off another DA as a counterattack to have a shot at winning. Luckily, on battle speed 6, the heavy armor's third attack happens right as the DA timer runs out. If he uses two regular attacks at one metal hand, he'll knock us right within range for a DA. Anyways, you know the drill by now. Odds of victory aren't even 1%, but I get it on my fourth attempt, yada yada yada. After beating the heavy armor, we can skip the soldier's uniform by simply walking behind a house to cross the river. There's no clear evidence that this hidden path is a bug, so I decided not to treat it as one. And we don't need to steal the third merchant's clothes, it's the cider that we actually need and we'll take that after the fight even if we don't steal. Therefore, we can just smack this guy with the black belt and move on. There is one last problem. Before we can give the kid the password to proceed, we need to talk to his father upstairs. And to get back to the starting area, it looks like we need to defeat the heavy armor again. But it turns out that dying in this area doesn't result in a game over. In fact, it takes us back to the start of the scenario, which happens to be exactly where we want to go. So we just pick a fight with another heavy armor, and get our butt whooped to proceed. From here, the path to Celeste and out of town is clear. Before the scenario is complete, we still need to take out tunnel armor. Since he's meant to be a tutorial boss for a runic ability, he tends to cast a lot of spells that hit like a truck. Looking a bit farther ahead, we also need to fight Kefka soon, and he also likes to cast a lot of spells while having even more HP. To take them on, we need to do a fair amount of grinding, and Celeste is the best candidate thanks to the Rune Edge weapon. This sword consumes MP to auto-crit, effectively doubling its damage output. This weapon also makes grinding faster. MP isn't a concern while grinding, since we can use all the elixirs and tinctures we want, then let Celeste die to respawn with the rare items and the EXP. It takes about an hour and 15 minutes to get Celeste to level 19, which is the point where she kills Kefka in 4 hits and Tuttle Armor in 2. With that, Tunnel Armor ended up taking 5 or 6 tries. Not that that's a long time or anything, but this is the only time in the entire playthrough where my luck in a boss fight was below average. Tunnel Armor hits Celeste reasonably often with physical attacks, but she refused to counterattack over and over again. Kefka, on the other hand, gave me perfect luck on my first attempt. He smacked me with physical attacks 3 times, then he used Muddle. While confused, we can start running to prevent Celeste from attacking herself. Then, when she gets hit by the next physical attack, she'll counterattack and use whatever attack she queued up while confused. This is exactly what happened, resulting in our victory. Before heading to the Southern Continent, we need to take out Dataluma and Ultros. Even though Dataluma uses mostly physical attacks and the flails we bought in Narsh allow us to hit for full damage from the back row, he's still dangerous because he has a fair bit of HP and buffs himself with safe. The minions he summons also drain a lot of HP. To get around safe, we can hire Shadow and Kolingjin and hope for a sweet Interceptor proc. With two sets of Fearings equipped, Shadow can demolish over half of the big guy's HP in a single hit. Since we only have one Black Belt for now, all non-Celeste and non-Shadow characters are useless here. Before we fight Dataluma, we need to fight some enemies since we'll need money to buy the most current armor and a handful of items. The best place to grind is in the Overworld Forest since the enemies come in large groups and aren't very threatening. We also build up an extra 10k for more black belts once we reach the southern continent. This took about one and a half hours. During the process, Celeste got to level 22 and Shadow got to level 16. At these levels, Dataluma only took two attempts. On the winning run, basically everything went wrong except that Interceptor proc twice, saving the day when Shadow was one hit away from kicking the bucket. As a reward, we acquire our first espers. You'd probably expect this to matter, but it doesn't really. We're not wasting any turns casting spells in battle, so the only spells with any real use are Cure, Float, and Imp. But what about the Esper bonuses? Those are important, right? 
To be honest, most desperate bonuses are overhyped and nearly useless. Magic bonuses, otherwise known as the only good ones, are also questionable in this playthrough since we're almost always relying on physical damage. It's a sad state of affairs. Anyways, we need to bring Celeste and Locke to the southern continent, but who else should come with us? It's not much of a choice since Gao and Cyan are just mediocre beatsticks while Sabin and Edgar have elemental weapons, most of which have spell procs. Sabin and Edgar it is. Neither Shadow nor Celeste can be brought to the Opera House battles, so it's Sabin with his high level and fire claws that'll take their place. The Opera Rats can be pretty nasty since the Green Rats will impale themselves on Sabin's claws, causing the Yellow Rats to waste their time summoning more. Because of this, we spend 20 minutes to level Sabin to 19 so that he can kill the Yellow Rats in one hit. Against Ultros, we put Sabin and Edgar on the same side of the screen since a multi-target tentacle does half as much damage while still provoking a counterattack. I should have used the Genji Glove here, but I didn't realize it would save a hit. It took a while to get past the rats, but Ultros himself went down on the first try. The Southern Continent marks another huge shift in the way we play the game. We can buy more Black Belts now, so the entire party can contribute instead of just using one or two characters for everything. This is just in time to offset the fact that nearly every enemy for the rest of the game has significantly higher defense than what we've been fighting so far, making it harder to fluke through bosses with a handful of lucky hits. The Magitech facility contains a series of four bosses to take down. The first fight is against Ifrit and Shiva, who will immediately fight to acquire their Magisite. Yeah, I know I'm pronouncing a lot of these names wrong, but you probably shouldn't complain too much because they'll start pronouncing them even worse if you do. Shiva never uses physical attacks and Ifrit uses very few, so it's not an easy fight. Combine that with their disgusting defense stats and the fact that they hit like trucks if they use an unreflectable attack, and we're not going to level our way out of this one easily. However, they are sitting right next to a save point with no cutscene beforehand, so Ifrit is practically begging for a counter DA to the face. We set Celeste up so his first attack will just barely knock her to low HP. She can survive two more physical attacks at that point, so she has several chances to pull off a counter DA. With her high magic stat and level, Celeste can easily kill Ifrit in one shot. After about 40 minutes, victory is ours. Now that we have the Espers in the Make Edgar Useful starter set containing the best armor and elemental swords, it's time to grind again. We start by fighting the Flans in the garbage disposal for 20 minutes. They have low defense and couldn't hurt a fly, but these battles are slow and their rewards are mediocre. Once we have enough money for Green Berets and Locke and Edgar have graduated from the school of not sucking, we can fight in the fields around Sen. These fights are better, but we need to run from 1 in 3 fights since double wyverns are risky with their cyclonic attacks. After 35 minutes, we learn Float and we can safely fight Chicken Lips in the forest. Both battles in the forest are doable, fast, and offer some of the best rewards on the island, so this will be our grind location of choice from here on out. After another 50 minutes, Celeste is level 25 and has a bit more HP, which will be useful for number 24. I want to fight number 24 now to get a second blizzard, which will help to kill the chicken lips and wyverns. In hindsight, I should have done this at level 24 or 26 since the trappers on the staircase like to wipe us with level 5 doom, but it worked out in the end. I was worried about number 24 since he'll never use any physical attacks again after he uses wall change for the first time. Fortunately, there's a short period of time between when the DA timer expires and when he uses wall change, so we have a small window where we can hit him with a DA. With battle speed 5 and message speed 1, he'll nearly always act within this window. Even with his bulky 4700 HP, a DA is enough to kill in one hit as long as we have earrings equipped. Other than that, there's nothing new here, and this fight took about an hour and 15 minutes. In a cruel twist of fate, we're given the flamesaver that's a rare drop instead of his common blizzard drop. I was a bit salty about this since half the reason behind fighting him in the first place was to get the blizzard, but I guess I can't complain given my other luck in the run. It certainly wasn't worth it to reset and spend another hour fighting him for the blizzard at any rate. After another hour and 45 minutes in the forest with Celeste dead this time, we hit the arbitrary benchmark of 1000 HP on every character, which I decided was probably just enough to finish the Magitech facility. That guess turned out to be pretty much bang on. During the minecart sequence, we give Savin and Edgar reflect rings to deal with the spells from the Meg Rotors so they aren't half dead by the time they reach the boss. Locke takes the Genji Glove since he can deal full damage from the back row. Number 128 gets really dangerous when its arms are dead, but there's nothing in particular that's really worth talking about. We get an extremely close win on the second attempt. Against the Cranes, Edgar really shines thanks to his water elemental tridents that hit a weakness on both. 
On the second try, the left crane quickly eats a counter from both him and Sabin and gets two shot in return. After that, victory is close to guaranteed. And with that, we're finally free of the Magitek facility. Time to look ahead to the next challenge. The most notable fight on Crescent Island is the battle between General Leo and Kafka. Since Leo can't be equipped, we can't win that fight by abusing the Reflect Ring or the Black Belt. That means that in order to minimize our turn count, Leo needs to kill Kafka in a single turn. That's 5000 HP we need to deplete. To figure out exactly how much we need to level, I plugged the game's damage formulas into a spreadsheet and determined what the best means of offense is. Thanks to his Atlas Armlet and Offering, Leo's regular attack has a decent chance to one-shot Kefka at level 42. In comparison, the best means of magical damage available is summoning Behemoth from a Magicite Crystal, but this doesn't have any hope of killing until level 45. Now if we could grind Leo directly, level 42 wouldn't be a big deal at all. However, we can't find any randoms with Leo in the party, so the level that he fights Kefka at will be exactly 5 levels above the average level of our regular party members. Therefore, we need to grind until our average party level is a whopping 37. We can shave a couple levels off by recruiting Mog at the end of our power grind, since Mog also joins 5 levels above the average, but we'll still be gaining a lot of levels regardless. Thankfully, we now have access to arguably the best grinding location in the World of Balance. Most of the Cave to the Sealed Gate only contains Ings and Zombones. These enemies give almost as much EXP as most enemies on the Floating Continent, and they're dead easy to kill. Zombones can inflict zombie, but they don't do it very often and it can help too, since zombies will sometimes attack the enemies. The only notable attack that Ings have is Life Shaver, which is earth elemental so it can be prevented by the earth absorbing Gaia gear. We can obtain that early by stealing it from Basket Force using a Thief Knife and the Black Belt. It only takes 15 minutes to get 4, so it's a worthy investment. Once we finish grinding for the grinding, we can start grinding. It took a whopping 6 hours and 10 minutes in the cave before the levels fell into place. Kefka shows up again at the end of the dungeon, but unlike in the Imperial camp, he doesn't waste any turns since we can wear Reflect Rings to bounce his spells back at him. At these levels, defeating all the soldiers at the Imperial Banquet is a breeze, so we can claim every Banquet reward and head to Crescent Island. Before the big Kefka fight, we need to fight a couple other bosses. Flame Eater is fairly unique in that he doesn't use any physical attacks, meaning that we can't leverage our trusty Black Belt against him. While his spells are reflectable, they heal him obviously since they're fire and he eats fire. However, we can counterattack against the balloons that he summons to kill those off. But what use is that if we still can't hit the boss itself? Well, after killing a few waves of balloons, Flame Eater eventually summons an enemy called a grenade. Conveniently enough, the grenade has the ability to berserk our characters, allowing us to finish the boss fight in zero turns in the most circuitous fashion possible. At normal levels, it's unlikely we'd last long enough for this plan to work, but we're already at somewhat normal levels for Kefka's tower, so this kill is pretty consistent. I should have equipped cure rings on everyone, but I was still testing whether cure rings or reflect rings would be more effective, and this succeeded on the first attempt. The strategy against Ultros is. And now we fight Kefka. After all that grinding, the battle itself is almost anticlimactic. Just click the button to win. With that, the Floating Continent is the only hurdle left to clear in the World of Balance. Before we can even reach the darn thing, we have a series of tricky fights to go through. At first I thought this would be a cakewalk, but that was before I realized that the Sky Armor enemies never physically attack. There's no convenient grenade to berserk us, so that means that we're adding another 6 turns to the total. Or not. You see, the Spitfire is capable of hitting us physically, and we can actually leverage this to hit all the enemies on the field using Cyan's unique Tempest weapon, which procs for wind slash 50% of the time. With that, we have a means of killing the Sky Armors. Unfortunately, there's a problem. Cyan is too strong. At this level, he nearly always one-shots the Spitfire with his regular attack, meaning that in each fight, we have a 50-50 chance of entering a soft lock. With 6 battles, this means that we'd need 64 attempts on average to win, and that's not even counting the fact that Cyan dies reasonably often if the Spitfire spams absolute zero. Unlike Ultros 1 and Vargas, each attempt takes 5 to 20 minutes, so we don't really want to gamble so much. If we revive Lock and Realm, Cyan's less likely to die, but then each attempt can take up to half an hour. However, with some outside the box thinking, we can increase our chances of winning dramatically. You see, we do have a way of making Cyan weaker. After the first fight, we can open the menu and cast Imp on Cyan outside of combat. 
This makes his attacks weak enough that he kills the Spitfire in two, sometimes three attacks. Windslash is unaffected though, so it still wipes the entire field. I hesitated to revive other characters earlier because it would make the battle longer, but we can make the Realm do some work for us now. By combining the Black Belt with the Heal Rod, she has a chance to heal the Spitfire if Cyan already damaged it, giving us extra chances to pull off a Windslash. Black Belt plus Heal Rod, huh? Never thought I'd see the day where that becomes useful. With this strat, we have about a 50% chance to win the first fight, and I'd estimate about a 40% chance to win the rest of the gauntlet. I got it on the second try. Ultros is no less embarrassing than last time, but Air Force is another boss that doesn't use any physical attacks. This time, we have no tricks up our sleeves so we're forced to take another turn. There's a dozen ways to win in one turn by now, but the easiest is to break a Thunder Rod on him for an instant victory. Atma Weapon is actually challenging even despite all the overleveling we've done. Considering all the other bosses in this part of the game have only been doing 1-200 damage with their physical attacks, the 500 damage that Atma does is no joke. It's almost like the game expected you to heal and attack in climactic boss fights instead of just sitting there. Since we need one relic slot for black belts, we only have one slot open for defense. Reflect rings deal with flare and fire too, and also prevent a bio spell from basically dooming the entire team with poison status, but the healing from cure rings is just too important to pass up. Again, I was still testing Reflect Rings when I managed to hit a winning run. One of the win conditions for this fight was getting a character berserked by Mind Blast, and that's exactly what happened in the second attempt. Not only that, but Locke happened to be the chosen one, which is the best case scenario by far. Locke's unique weapon, the Hawkeye, is occasionally thrown at floating enemies to deal three times the damage. This easily makes up for Atma's lack of an elemental weakness. Stacking that with the damage bonus from Berserk allows us to bring him down just a few hits. Time sections are a lot harder when we're so passive, so the floating continent escape isn't free at all. Nadis are inescapable in the only encounter here, so we have to fight every battle. They also have cold dust which can freeze characters, so we can't leave Locke by himself and let him wreck shop. We can load up three characters such that they'll always kill in two hits and often kill in one. The Nadis are weak to both fire and lightning, so we give Celeste and Realm Genji gloves and elemental weapons. If they proc a spell, they kill in one attack. Locke has his trusty Hawkeye, which has a 50% chance of being thrown for a one-hit kill. However, this didn't go according to plan at all. First off, I killed Terra before the escape sequence and I was expecting her to stay dead since I tested the same thing with a dead Realm earlier. For whatever reason, Terra was revived when Realm wasn't, so we have an extra target on the field that can't counterattack. Combine that with terrible menuing and bad luck during several fights, and this isn't off to the greatest start. We ignore the useless elixir. Against Narappa, we swap Celeste's Flame Tongue for an Ice Brand in battle to save every second that we can. Narappa isn't much of a boss despite the hype he's given, so he goes down in a single hit. This leaves us with just 6 seconds to spare when we get to the end, which means we have exactly 2 seconds to select the option to wait and save Shadow, in theory at least. I think this is the closest escape sequence I've ever done. Despite being able to save him, I actually let Shadow die. Now, you might have thought I was kind of dumb and let Shadow die accidentally because I panicked, but actually I was being really dumb and let Shadow die deliberately because of a mistake. I don't want to go into it, but suffice it to say I didn't catch this error for quite a while. So, uh, you won't be seeing him again. And with that, the World of Balance has been completed, and in only 30 turns no less. But things only get harder from here, is what you might say if you're not paying attention to the video length. In the world of Ruin, there's no obstacles to recruiting Sabin since we can just run from everything. We also pick up the Valuable Drainer which will be useful in the Tentacle fight. In this fight, we're strapped for Relic slots since the Black Belt is mandatory. We want the Cure Ring to heal, the Reflect Ring since they have spells, and the Running Shoes to prevent Seize. So what do we pick? Well, Seize is annoying, but it isn't much of a threat since its damage is low and doesn't scale with our HP. The Cure Ring won out over the Reflect Ring before, but we have the Drainer to heal this time. To boot, their spells are poisonous which means they're a slow death if they hit us, and a slow victory if they poison the tentacles instead. We swap to the Drainer whenever we want to heal, and we swap in the Atma Weapon or the appropriate Elemental Blade when we want damage, and the tentacles will eventually go down. Delhan is yet another boss that doesn't use any physical attacks. Or at least he doesn't until we hit him 8 times, so we can't do that either. Fortunately, we do have an ace up our sleeve that I've been waiting to use for a while, and that's the zombie status, which is conveniently everywhere in Daryl's tomb. Since Cesar has no fire elemental weapons, he's the designated survivor for this fight. Everyone else is geared up with as much firepower as possible, 
so Delahan is easily incinerated. We'll want to keep our zombie status for now, so let's avoid visiting any inns or changing our party. There's a million options for what to do next, but we go to Mount Zozo first to pick up some great gear like the elemental shields. Then we set our sights on Narsh. Tritouch is the reason why we wanted to keep our zombie status around. Our team of zombies, conveniently armed to the teeth with fire weapons, are needed since Tritouch is another boss that only casts spells. The weapons themselves barely tickle Tritouch through its massive defense, but they all proc spells that'll do meaningful damage. Setzer, with a nice shield and ribbon, is immune to all of Tritouch's attacks and the status effects that are occasionally inflicted by zombified party members, so our victory is guaranteed. By now, you might see what the goal of this trip is. We nab Mog from the Narsh Mines and hop down into Umaro's lair to fight the Yeti himself. Umaro attacks multiple times in a turn and uses mainly weak physicals, so he goes down with no effort. And with that, the game is basically over. In case you never bothered to use him, to be fair, that's normally a wise decision, Umaro's gimmick is that he's a berserker. In other words, he'll attack on his own without having to select anything for the menu. With Umaro in tow, we grind a core party of Locke, Cyan, Umaro, and Mog to level 99 in the Dinosaur Forest. With the best grinding location in the game in the EXP egg, it takes a mere 7 hours to max out a party's level. To be honest, this is very excessive, but I just wanted to know how long it would take and see how much the endgame could be demolished even under these restrictions. The rest of the World of Ruin is a series of curb stop battles. With a character that can actually attack an excessive power on our side, most bosses go down in less than 2 minutes. It's so easy that it's not really worth it to discuss any routing or most of the boss fights. In fact, I needed to write an extra sentence into this script to get the pacing on the boss montage right. There are a few notable boss fights left though. Magimaster is the only fight where Umaro shouldn't be in the party. Instead, just sit there with Reflect Rings on. All of his spells are reflectable and he'll never use wall change if we never attack. With max HP, his Ultima Death Counter won't kill us either. We get nothing useful for completing this fight, but at least we can say we did it. Rexel is a bit luck reliant. His gimmick is that he'll possess a random character and won't reappear until that character dies. Since we don't have the luxury of killing people and reviving him, we have to hope that he possesses the right characters and let him die at the hands of the Soul Savers. We stagger our HP so Locke will die immediately, and Monk will die quickly after we remove his Paladin Shield. The hope is that he'll possess Locke and then Mog to give us two chances to deal damage. It turns out that we only needed one though. On the first attempt that he possessed Locke, he died before he got a chance to possess anyone else. God has actually managed to kill me once, which is relatively impressive. She can use Love Token which causes characters to defend her from physical attacks. While we can bypass this with the offering, Umaro still managed to kill himself with his tackle attack on the first attempt. Oh well. Anyways, I think it's about time to head to the final battle. Thankfully, this fight is not among the World of Ruin curb stomp battles we've seen thus far, so we can avoid a complete anticlimax. The strat isn't exactly optimal, but it's close enough. Umaro needs to last through the first three tiers, and to that end we give him the Marvel Shoes to get safe, shell, haste, and region all at once. He also needs a ribbon so that he doesn't get gimped by zombie or petrify. Cyan and Locke, with the Tempest and Offering respectively, can hit multiple targets for maximum damage with their counter attacks. Perhaps surprisingly, we can enter the final battle with status effects applied. Because of this, we can devote the last party slot to zombified characters. These characters serve three purposes. First, they can attack the enemies, obviously. Second, by equipping the zombies with ice elemental weapons and giving Locke and Cyan ice shields, we can use the zombies to heal our party, too. Finally, the zombies are removed from the fight after every tier. This allows us to guarantee that Mog won't show up until tier 3. That way, we don't need to waste his relic slot on a ribbon, and he still won't get gimped with zombie or petrify. With all that said, here's how this plays out. Tier 1 is a slaughter fest because all the bosses like their physical attacks and get punished heavily for that. Tier 2 is much more dangerous. Only hit uses physical attacks, so multi-target counterattacks from the Tempest and Offering are important here. The bosses can inflict a wide variety of status effects and use some gravity attacks that mostly negate the advantage of our enormous HP pools. We also keep our cursor ready to swap Locke's Atma weapon to a blizzard in case Tiger decides to zombify him. Zombie Lock with an Atma weapon would slaughter everyone, friend or foe. On the winning attempt, Locke succumbs to poison just before the tier is defeated. Tier 3 was tense because W went and knocked Umaro and Cyan to low HP just before sleep started spamming Meteo. Umaro pulled off two clutch dodges and barely tanked a third Meteo with his region before taking sleep out. 
Not only that, but Sleep's instant death death counter happened to hit Realm, so Umaro and Mog both made it to the fight with Kefka. This is it, the final battle. I wasn't expecting Umaro to be alive at this point, but it's certainly nice that he's still around even if Mog is the designated survivor. Mog has the Paladin Shield to absorb all elements and attain perfect defense, which reduces all incoming physical damage to 1. His magic defense is also so high that even Kefka's ultimate skill, Goner, does less damage than a region tick heals. With those defenses and region from the Marvel Shoes, Mog is very hard to kill, even though he effectively starts the fight with only 1 HP thanks to Fallen One. We also pick up Sabin and Gogo, the final characters that were brought to the tower. Sabin's level is relatively low, but with his ultimate weapons, the Imp Halberd and the other Imp Halberd, he can still pull off some decent damage. Gogo uses the same setup, but we recruited him after grinding the other characters to level 99, so that he'd be high level too. So he hits like a truck. My good luck decided to hold for the final fight. The zombies home in on Kefka like laser guided missiles and never kill Umaro. Kefka also never attacks Umaro, letting him wreak havoc. Once Kefka begins charging for Goner, he loses the ability to counterattack with Hyperdrive for a turn, and that pretty much seals the deal. This is about as fast and safe as the fight could have been. So, that's the ball game. It turns out that it's possible to beat this game in only 28 turns at the absolute best, though this run only managed to do it in 30. I'm not sure if it's possible to improve on this at all. If I missed anything, it's probably an early game grinding location or a way to beat Air Force without spending a turn. Our in-game time clocked in at about 40 hours, which means that we didn't even spend a single turn per hour of gameplay. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed watching.